The following is a hoop ball presentation. Welcome to the Fantasy NBA Today podcast. And I realized this morning as I was about to start recording this podcast that uh, our Monday show, we put the Toronto Raptors in the Atlantic division and we don't know that that's actually going to be the case this year because the Raptors are playing in Tampa Bay, lest we forget. So it sounds like there's a possibility that the Wizards could move into the Atlantic division for this year and then swap back when Toronto plays at home, presumably next season. But whatever, we'll just, you know, we're, it doesn't really matter for how we're breaking things down. Just, uh, you know, something to throw it in the back of your head. Doesn't have any bearing on anything. Really, no bearing on anything at all. Um, other than, I guess, you know, you don't have to think about the uh, customs travel part if you were going to be handicapping that way. In any event... This is Fantasy NBA Today. Welcome to the show, everybody. It's Wednesday morning. I'm Dan Bespris. Thank you, as always, for giving us some of your time during the day. It's uh, the ramp up. We're really, we're, we're at it now. We are 27 days from the start of the NBA season. We're under four weeks. I didn't do our little four-week kazoo blast yesterday. So we'll do it today. Wow. 27 days from the start of the NBA season. That is remarkable. Boy, did this jump on us. Remember like three weeks ago, we were like, we got like 50 days. How the hell are we going to pull this off? Well, we got 27 now. Winding it down. Today on the docket for our Wednesday show, we're breaking down the Southeast Division. That's the reason that that little Toronto tidbit popped into my head, which of course the Hawks... They've uh, dramatically retooled Hawks. The Hornets, a mildly retooled Hornets team. The Magic, running it back. The Heat, running it back. And the Wizards, getting some guys back. Not too many other large changes on that Washington side. It's kind of a fun division, really. Uh, you got a lot of teams. You have the Heat, who made the finals. You have a couple of teams in Atlanta and Charlotte, call them young, kind of up and coming. Certainly, I, I think Atlanta probably more coming, at least in terms of making a run at a playoff spot. Charlotte is not at that level yet. Although signing Hayward does make them better. They gave him a ton of money, but it does make them a better team. He'll probably start at small forward. That, that most likely bumps P.J. Washington to the bench, if I had to guess. Maybe Miles Bridges, depending on how they go there. Unless they decide they want to go Devontae Grant. Well, they also drafted Lamella. All right, well, we'll get to that. So uh, that's that's one of the things we're going to be talking about the podcast, so no reason to get out in front of ourselves. You can follow me on Twitter at Dan Bespris or just Google search Dan from Hoop Ball. That is the easiest way. I'm going to do it right now because for a while I've been saying just Google search Dan from Hoop Ball and saying, oh, well, I'll pop up pretty early. Yeah, uh, the first three results are... All various hoop ball related things. I <laughs> think you can find my LinkedIn page, like five down the board. But, you know, whatever. Who the hell who the hell checks that anyway? Um, yeah, my, my Twitter feed is the third result when I Google search Dan from Hoop Ball. I would strongly recommend you guys do give me a follow on Twitter. It's where I do all of my communicating when outside of these, you know, 45 minute podcasts I put out every day. Once this thing is out, once this pod is out, there's no other way for me to talk to you guys outside of Twitter, which yesterday, those of you that do follow me, saw uh, effectively a tweet storm on all the things we've been talking about on this podcast with relation to free money. And I, I got to start today's podcast with it. And it's not really a promo at this point. It is because some of you guys aren't yet signed up with our buddies at mybookie.ag. So please take a second, pause the show, go to mybookie.ag. Sign up using promo code HOOPBALL. And then we're going to win a crap ton of money together. And we're not even going to have to worry about it. It's very easy. Once you set up your account, if you go to mybookie.ag and go to the Sportsbook homepage, they have this scrolling media wall where they're, all their various promos are going on. And right now, 
the Thanksgiving Day and Black Friday promos have big panels there where you can learn more about them, which is what we've been talking about on this podcast. So very quickly, again today, for those that missed it on yesterday's show, if you heard it yesterday, you can fast forward about two and a half, three minutes here because this is this is one of the most important things we're going to do on this podcast all year long because we have this very rare, very short window to go win anywhere from 100 to $400 over two days without having to risk anything. I know it sounds too good to be true, but here's, what, here's how this works. Sports betting websites, I don't think I'm giving away any trade secrets here. They just want you at their site. They are literally willing to give you money as long as you have to deposit something because they believe that even if we win our Thanksgiving risk-free $250 bet, so I'm going to put $250 in my account today because all of my money's still tied up in elections wagers that they haven't graded out yet. So I'm going to put $250 in my account today. As soon as the risk-free Thanksgiving bet opens up for tomorrow morning, I will be putting $250 on... I don't know, one of those teams, Lions or Texans. I don't know crap about either of them, but I'm going to be doing it. <laughs> and if I win, terrific. I win 200 and, uh, what, $25? Was it 250 to win 225 Am I getting that right? Um, and what I'll probably do at that point is cash out my initial 250 I'll just take the 250 out that I deposited. Boom. Throw it back into my wallet as an e-check or a Bitcoin withdrawal. Leave the $225 winnings in the account for the next day, Black Friday, where there will be odds boost wagers all day long. I think there's going to be 13 of them. They almost always win. I can, I can pretty much guarantee that of the 13 odds boost bets that they're going to make available, nine will win or more. It could be all 13, but I can, I can almost guarantee that nine will win. So without even, you could just close your eyes and bet 13 things, one every hour. They only open it up on the hour every hour, so we have to be paying attention to it. And you'll go at least nine and four. You're going to win at least five units on that next day. Probably quite a bit more than that. Probably quite a bit more. So I'll take my 225 and I'll use it on those bets throughout the day. I'll probably win another 100 to $150. I'll have almost $400 in my account of winnings from these two days. And maybe I'll play with that. Maybe I'll cash it out. I haven't decided yet. The reason they do this is the sports book expects you to just leave that money in there and keep gambling it and lose it. But the beauty of this set of promotions is that you can pretty much make enough to just take your deposit back out and play with the winnings. Be smart and we can get free money. It's so easy if we have discipline, but a lot of people don't. Probably 95% of people don't have discipline. So a sports book's like, yeah, pff, sure. I'll give the other 5% of people some free money if 19 out of 20 of you guys just give it all back to the sports book. But we're not going to do that here on Fantasy NBA Today. Those of you that listen to this show and follow me on Twitter for all these promos, we're just going to keep building and we're going to cash out. So there's no way we can end up down. So follow along with me on that. We'll be doing... Uh, I mean, tomorrow, the Thursday one is an easy one. It's just one bet you make in the morning, and then, you know, it's done. The Friday one, we're going to be doing all day, every day. I'll be tweeting it out on the hour, setting out pictures, making sure everybody sees what I'm doing so we can all do it together. Again, mybookie.ag, promo code HOOPBALL, all one word. When you sign up, let's win a bunch of money together. Easy. Diving into the depth charts now, we will start with the Atlanta Hawks. We'll just go alphabetically. Sure. Why the hell not? Atlanta, super retooled, super retooled, especially after the Kings did not match Bogdan Bogdanovich uh, late last night. And so he now is also a member of a very crowded Hawks shooting guard position. The Hawks also signed Rajon Rondo, Chris Dunn, 
Danilo Gallinari, acquired Tony Snell, signed Solomon Hill, and then, as we mentioned, signed Bogdan Bogdanovich as a restricted free agent. This was a team that a week ago, we looked at and we were like, easy. Well, Trey Young, of course, is going to be the lead horse at point guard. At shooting guard, I was already in the midst of saying, between Kevin Herter, Cam Reddish, DeAndre Hunter, those three guys were kind of splitting the minutes at shooting guard and small forward. And I thought, well, when all three of them are healthy, it's going to be hard for any of them to get above the fray. I thought Reddish had probably the best opportunity there. But who cares now? Because they're all cooked. Their geese are cooked. Because Bogdan is your starting shooting guard on this team. Gallo is your starting small forward. And the rest of those guys are backing him up. And if you were thinking, well, remember last year, Dan, Kevin Herter actually was quite good as the backup point guard, kind of a point forward spot. Sorry to tell you, Rajon Rondo is the backup point guard now. They actually have one. They have a point guard who will run the offense. Rondo has his limitations, of course. We saw how well he played in the playoffs for the Lakers, but he was an awful regular season player. They have Chris Dunn, who's not that great of a point guard, but a hell of a defender. Plenty of guys in front of Herter for lead ball handler when Trey Young is not on the floor. Everything that Atlanta did is cool. It's good for them winning basketball games, which you want from a... You know, is this team going to be competitive the last five games of the regular season? And I think the answer now is yes. They're going to be fighting with teams like the Magic for that last playoff seed in the Eastern Conference. I think ultimately they might come up, well, doesn't matter. We don't need to get into that on today's show. But almost every player on this team took a hit over the last week, whether it's new guys coming in or guys that were already there. Trey Young, of course, he is the everything for this franchise, but... They're not going to need him to be on the floor for every second of every game. He played 35.3 minutes per game last year, took 21 shots a night, 30 points, 9 and change assists, 3.5 three-pointers, a steal, high-volume free throws, colossal turnover numbers. He had a great season by, all, by every fantasy metric, aside from field goal percent, but even that was a nice step forward from the previous year. But they're not going to need him to do that much this season. I want to make sure that I put the emphasis on the right word there. They're going to need him to do a lot. I'm not saying they don't need him to do that much. They just don't need him to do that much as I point at the numbers on my computer screen that I just repeated to you guys. They're not going to need him to do 34 and 9 and a half. They're not going to need him to do 21 shots and 9 and a half free throws. Because there are other options on this team remember John Collins missed half of last year so for half the season there was literally no one else on that team besides Trey Young he had to do everything himself he is going to be a very good fantasy player again this year but I think I believe that almost everything for him takes a small hit I don't think the usage is as high as it was last year. I think the fact that you have a backup two, mind you, backup point guards, allows the Hawks to take him off the floor for a minute. Gallo, Danilo Gallinari, actually makes a really big difference here because someone else on this team now can go and get a bucket. Gallo can do it. Bogdan can kind of go and get a bucket. John Collins should be there for the whole year. They now have a viable center, although I don't think that really does much to Trey Young, but it certainly does something to John Collins, who was seeing a lot of his time at center last year, and he gets pushed now much more heavily, not all the time, but heavily, to the power forward spot. One thing that's good for the Atlanta front court, at least from a can these guys be close to what they were doing last year, is that they really don't have backup power forwards and centers Uh, They drafted a backup power forward, if I'm not mistaken, but that'll be, you know, they'll be easing him in. For the most part, Clint Capella is the starting center. John Collins is going to play the backup center role, which means if Collins is playing 33 minutes, I would assume that probably 10 of those are at the center spot, which leaves roughly 20-some-odd power forward minutes, and you'll probably see Gallo 
bump up and get a few of those. So the fact that there's a thousand point guards, shooting guards, and small forwards on this team actually, you know, it smushes the value of guys like Herter and Reddish and even Bogdan Bogdanovich to a certain degree. And I'm not going to say it smushes Trey Young, but it does diminish him slightly. Doesn't have quite the impact on Gallo, Collins, and Capella. I think a lot of people are worried that those guys are going to end up fighting each other. But we're fortunate that there just aren't that many other options in the front court besides those three main dudes. There are other names, there are other humans that can play those positions. But on a Hawks team that's now, I mean, this is the moves they've made this offseason. They're, they're telling us they want to make the playoffs. So they're not going to be screwing around with a rookie who's making mistakes. It's training time for the rookies. It's playing time for Gallo, Collins, and Capella. So I'm less worried about those three guys than I am about some of the dudes in the backcourt. Clint Capella was number 24 before he got hurt last year and then kind of just took the rest of the season off, even if he might have been able to play. 14 and 14 might be asking a bit much on a team where there are other players who are actual front court players, which wasn't the case on the Houston Rockets. It was Capella, and then you had to go all the way down to, you know, P.J. Tucker at like 6'6". So he had every rebound he could want. He'll be fighting with John Collins for some of the rebounds. So 14 and 14 is probably a uh, a bit um, optimistic for Clint. But I do think that he's playing 30 minutes a game. I think he's going to have good steals, blocks. His field goal percent number is going to be through the roof playing with Trey Young and Rajon Rondo. Uh, and he's getting drafted really late. So, you know, there are some fears with Trey, uh, excuse me, with Capella, and it's forcing him down the board. And yesterday, someone asked me about Capella. I think it, I think it was on social media. I lost track, honestly, of most of the things going on in my life at this point. Uh, and, and I was looking at it, and I was like, okay, well, you know, there's there are these reasons where we could be a little bit concerned that, you know, maybe John Collins takes his center minutes. But at the same time, that would force Atlanta to take to not play their best guys, if that makes sense. Meaning, if Collins moves up and plays a bunch of center minutes and Capella's stuck at like 26 minutes a game, leaving basically 22 center minutes for John Collins, that moves Gallo up to the power forward spot. And now Atlanta's making a choice. They're saying, do we want to play Capella at center or do we want to play like Herder at small forward? So it will have some, I think it'll depend a bit on the opponent, but I'm not that worried. I think that the Hawks have lacked that type of center before. So I think you're looking at at least, at least high 20s in minutes for Clint. So, you know, is he going to be top 24? Probably not. Is he going to go for 14 and 14? I mean, his scoring actually could stay similar on a team that plays as fast as the Hawks are going to play. But, I, you know, I wouldn't bank on it. So dial him back a little bit. But this is a guy now that's getting drafted. I mean, early ADPs suggest that he might be going at the end of the fifth round. That's an easy one. Am I worried about his health? No, not really. I think he probably could have played at the end of last year, but there wasn't really any reason to do so. So Trey Young, slight arrow down. He's gonna be great, but we have to be we have to be cognizant of these little things. Gallo, I think you'll probably see a slight arrow down, if only just because he's on a team that has more scoring options than last year. John Collins, a definite arrow down, because more minutes at power forward decreases his value, and now they actually have a center. A real one. So I mean, that's what I was saying. Basically, everybody on this team has their arrow pointed slightly down. Capello's arrow slightly down because he's not going to play as many minutes as he did in Houston last year. It's everyone. Bogdan Bogdanovich, he was going to be a lead horse in Sacramento. He's, you know, the fourth option on the Hawks. Arrow down for everybody on this team. It's a shame. There's just, there's too much talent. They're going to be better, but sometimes it's better not to have that many good teammates. Which of these guys do I think I end up with? I probably end up with Capella. Because I think he's the one guy where you look at the ADP and you're thinking, yeah, you know what? There's a pretty good path. Like, he's a worst case scenario for Clint is probably, you know, top 60. And a best case is, like, top 30. 
If he's getting drafted near 60, that means that his window largely exists above his draft position. That's what you want. Simplify your draft, friends and family. Simplify your draft. The Charlotte Hornets, the next team to talk about on today's ledger. And they, too, have made a couple of changes, drafting LaMelo Ball and signing Gordon Hayward. They have a bunch of draft picks, but I'm not super worried about those. Of course, the one thing that still stands out with this Hornets team is that after all of this, they don't yet have a center they trust. It's still Cody Zeller and Bismack Biombo out there. And they can't really go ultra small. Miles Bridges would probably be the small ball center, and maybe you throw in a rookie, but, I mean, that's no way for them to start to turn a corner. I... Last year, I hated the Hornets. You guys probably remember that from the podcast. I basically was like, look, this is a team you can... There was a stretch where I thought that team might not have anyone inside the top 100 in 9-cat. And then, you know, as the season started to wind down, uh, Terry Rozier, Devontae Graham, they both solidified themselves as top 80 fantasy players. But that was the those were the two best on the team. They had Rozier at 77. In nine cat. That was their best fantasy player last year. 77. Yuck. But they'll have a little bit more this year, I think. Uh, you know, I'm not drafting LaMelo Ball, and he'll he'll have opportunity on this team. But what they've done now is they're they're going to squeeze out one of the young wing forward types. I don't know if it's gonna be Washington or Bridges, but one of those two guys is gonna get squeezed because Devontae Graham is gonna play. Terry Rozier is going to play, Gordon Hayward is going to play, and LaMelo Ball is going to play. Those are four guys, two of whom, three of whom, honestly, you could, you could classify as a point guard. Ball, Graham, Rozier. Three of those guys are basically point guards. The biggest among them, probably either Ball or Rozier, will slide up and play a decent amount of shooting guard because you can't have three point guards. Uh, they had two last year, and Rozier and Graham ended up playing side by side. One of them will probably be the gunner that comes off the bench, and you know that would probably be either Rozier or Graham, depending on how they want to stack their team. That pushes Hayward, a lot of his minutes, up to small forward, and then the Hornets have to make a decision because they just gave Gordon Hayward all the money they had, meaning he's going to play, meaning Miles Bridges or P.J. Washington is going to get squished. Unless they actually play one of those guys at center, which could work against a handful of teams, but not against most of them. Because those actually aren't that big of dudes. I mean, compared to me, they are, obviously. But yeah, P.J. Washington is 6'7". What's Miles Bridges? Isn't he about that same height? 6'7", six, 6'8", six, something in that neck of the woods? 6'6", six, six, excuse me. I gave him an inch too much. They can't really run a Houston Rockets-style ultra-small ball team because they're just, you know, the personnel isn't built for it. So Cody Zeller's going to get to play a bunch of center again, and he's going to play well for a couple of games, and he's going to get hurt. And then he's going to be boring, and that'll be the same old Coley Zeller story that we've had forever. And he'll be borderline useful in nine category leagues, and mostly you can leave him alone unless you want to try to catch lightning in a bottle. Between Miles Bridges and PJ Washington, uh, neither one of those guys <laughs> was good enough to use last year. They're both way, way down the board. And now you have to you look at them and and you're trying to make a call on whether or not to care about either of them. P.J. Washington was 157, Miles Bridges was 161. So not only were they both not very good in fantasy, but they were actually quite close to one another. In a grouping with the lovely uh, Seth Curry, JaVale McGee, and uh, Time Lord and Marvin Bagley. Um, last year, Miles Bridges was at 13, 5.5, and, and 1.4 combined defensive stats. P.J. Washington was at 12 and 5.5 and with 1.7 combined defensive stats. Neither one of them shot the ball well. Miles Bridges was better at the free throw line, and uh, P.J. Washington was a little bit better from the field. But if these two guys are really battling each other now for the backup small forward and starting power forward minutes, that does, well, it makes it hard for them to get to that 30-minute plateau that they were sitting at last year. Because there are other humans on this team that are going to play a little bit. Cody Martin they like as a bench guy. Malik Monk, who I presume is now over his... I guess it was an addiction issue, hopefully. Uh, if, he's, if he's seeing more shooting guard minutes, then again, that's more Gordon Hayward at small forward. So 
I don't think I was drafting Bridges or Washington anyway, but the fact that they brought in Gordon Hayward and gave him 120 mil really lops that one off at the knees. I don't have a clue where Hayward's going to get drafted this year. Uh, Early ADP indicators is that he's going in the sixth round, which is way too late for a guy who posted fourth round value on a team with Jason Tatum, Kemba Walker, and Jalen Brown ahead of him in the pecking order. Now he goes to a Charlotte team where, what? Rozier? Graham? Question mark? You know I'm always going to read the teleprompter. He could legitimately be the first option on that team on many instances. They're going to use him, and they're going to use him a ton. I think that ADP goes up with Hayward, but if it doesn't, I will probably have a lot of Gordon Hayward on my fantasy team. We'll see. We'll keep an eye on that. Uh, Other notable creatures on this team, where are they going? Terry Rozier is getting drafted relatively late right now. Devontae Graham also getting drafted relatively late. And you can understand it because with Ball coming in, with Hayward coming in, those two guys handled the basketball in basically every possession for Charlotte last year, and they're not going to be the lead dogs that they were. They're still, I think, going to get a lot of playing time. Uh, Devontae Graham is... He's a tough one, because if the field goal percent doesn't come up, then you're really up a creek. At least with Rozier, I think you have a slightly safer floor. Those guys are dicey to me. Uh, you know, if they really are going in the 80s and 90s, you could make a decent argument to to take a swing, but LaMelo Ball creates a log jam there. Rozier strikes me as the guy that can do more without the basketball, because he was playing a bit more off-ball last year. Graham is the one that probably is in more trouble, but... We'll see. I mean, to me, it's just not really worth the big swing on Devontae now that they now that they do have their kind of their point guard of the future. But if they decide to make Graham the bench gunner and go with a starting unit of LaMelo Ball at point guard, Rozier shooting guard, Hayward small forward, all three of those guys probably would have some value. And, you know, I'll leave Ball alone because he's a rookie. Let's do the Miami Heat. They're an easy one. They're the same team they were last year. They brought Gor- uh, Goran Dragic back on a two-year deal. They brought in Mo Harkless to replace Jay Crowder, and otherwise everything is basically the same. Derek Jones Jr. is now in Portland, but he was basically only seeing minutes when someone was out anyway, and they re-signed Myers Leonard to an absurdly large deal, <laughs> and they just gave Bam Adebayo a max extension, so no surprise there. Um... You know, the only thing you look at with this team is is with Jay Crowder gone, who does that bump into the starting power forward spot? My guess would be that they do what they did in the regular season last year, which was start Myers Leonard and Adebayo side by side, let Bam guard power forwards on defense and play center on offense, then let Myers kind of stretch it out and uh, move away from the bucket on the offensive side. But you never know. They could slide Mo Harkless up to play the four. Andre Iguodala could play the four. Um, Kelly Olynyk, I guess, they could use if they wanted to. Either way, you're not drafting those guys. You're not. Harkless would be the closest thing to getting drafted if he ends up getting Jay Crowder's straight usage. He's He's a member of the Marvin Thad contingent, which is if he gets 30 minutes, he's a 1-1-1 one, one, and one guy. Uh, which means he's probably worth grabbing with your last draft pick in a 15-round draft. You know, get him around pick 180 just to see what happens. Because we've been on Harkless Watch before, and he does actually have a pretty useful nine-category fantasy game. He just very rarely gets to play enough to do it. The reason that there's a chance he might get to do enough on this team in particular is because some of these guys are going to be gassed. Goran Dragic is going to be gassed. Jimmy Butler, Adebayo, Duncan Robinson, Tyler Hero. All these guys went deep into the bubble, played a ton of minutes. You know, Robinson and Hero, they can bounce back a bit easier as the younger guys that I just listed off. But, like, Jimmy Butler, he missed a bunch of games last year, and that was without the super short offseason and crazy deep bubble run. Butler's going to get rest days. Dragic is going to get rest days, which means that Duncan Robinson is a very safe 
draft pick. He's going to get plenty of shots because they didn't bring in anybody else to chew up usage. Tyler Hero is probably going to get a bunch of shots, but his fantasy game still leaves a bit to be desired. I think he'll be overdrafted. And then that's why Mo Harkless is is notable because there will be plenty of days where just a crap load of guys are out. And he's going to have to take 10, 11 shots on those games. If you can get Mo Harkless to take 10 or 11 shots on a night, he's a guaranteed fantasy value. The problem is that most of the time he won't. So you're, you're, pl- you're, you're rostering a guy that you probably can't start every single game. But when you do, you know, if you get the, oh, Jimmy Butler's resting today, drop Harkless in there, you're probably going to get like a top 75 kind of performance from him. So maybe. Makes more sense in Roto, I think, than head-to-head with a games cap where you can just squat on a guy for half the time. Uh, but I think worth a last round kind of thing. Not so much because of massive upside, but because he ends up being a bit of a handcuff. Your last round pick in a 15-round Roto draft can actually be a guy where you're like, you know what, I'm going to try to get like 25, 30 good games out of this dude. Because it's either that or just rotate the roster spot. And you might end up doing that anyway. Not drafting Myers Leonard, not drafting Kelly Olynyk, basically avoiding Butler and Adebayo, although Bam, you know, younger Iron Man type, you can probably write off the deep bubble run a little bit, but it does scare me. Not drafting Dragic. Duncan Robinson's probably the one Heat guy that I look at like, yeah, you know what, I'll probably draft him uh, and and get a truckload of three-pointers from the dude because there's no way he's going to get drafted early. I think he's going around 100 right now. And he'll beat that easily this year. He'll beat that easily. Robinson was number 87 last year, and his job is just going to get better. With all the rest games for Butler and all the guys around him and just sort of a thinning of the herd, just a little bit more for him to do. Guys, wanted to quickly make mention of our buddies over at Manscaped.com because they are actually running a special this week. Manscaped has a Black Friday sale for 25% off, and you can use the promo code HOOPBALL20 to get an additional 20% off, I believe. That's what I'm told. If it doesn't work, you can yell at me, and I'll yell at them. But on Black Friday, for a limited time only, 25% off your entire order and free shipping. So you don't even need that from the HOOPBALL code. But then drop in HOOPBALL20, see if you can knock a few extra bucks off that stuff. They got the Lawnmower 3.0. They've got the Weed Whacker, the Shears. If you were thinking about getting something at Manscaped Friday or Cyber Monday, Black Friday or Cyber Monday are the two days you should be doing it because you can save a bunch of extra money and you can let them know HoopBall sent you with promo code HoopBall20. 20% off. Don't need the free shipping because they're doing that for you anyway. Again, Manscaped.com. Get your pinch-free, waterproof grooming technology from the company that has perfected it. Don't get, you know, don't get your sideburn trimmer from a place that makes candy. Get your sideburn trimmer from a place that makes sideburn trimmers. This is what they do. Expertise. Manscaped.com. Do it on Friday. Don't do it today. If you've waited this long, wait two more days and then save yourself a few extra bucks. Easy peasy. Orlando's an easy one, aren't they? Vooch, still there. Aaron Gordon, for now, still there. Jonathan Isaac, still hurt. Evan Fournier, took his qualifying offer. DJ Augustine, gone. Markel Fultz, starting point guard. Terrence Ross, gunner. This is an easy one. This is an easy one. The only question for this Magic team is, do they play someone like Al Farouk Aminu at power forward, slide Aaron Gordon down to small forward, in the Jonathan Isaac replacement debate? Or do they go smaller? Do they... They brought in Dwayne Bacon. Maybe do they start Dwayne Bacon at shooting guard and slide Fournier up to small forward and let Gordon keep his power forward spot? Or maybe Gary Clark starts at small forward. That's really the only question on this Orlando Magic team because they have their clear point guard in Markel Fultz whose fantasy game is not as big as the numbers might indicate. Uh, Fultz is likely to be overdrafted this year. He's number 170 last year in 28 minutes a game because he doesn't hit three-pointers. He doesn't hit free throws. Um, and he assists a little bit, but not enough to cover the fact that there's a lack of scoring and rebounding. He's what I referred to many times last year as poor man's Alfred Payton from a fantasy perspective. Does his game get better? Yeah, he probably gets a little better season over season. 
He doesn't have Augustine breathing down his neck, so you're probably looking at more like 30 to 31 minutes per game for Fultz instead of 28. But even that wouldn't have been enough last year to get him up and over the hump. So Fultz is probably a guy that I'm dodging, just based on the idea that point guards tend to go a little bit early. People freak out, and then they go and they grab someone thinking they're not going to have a chance to do it. But again, this is such a weird offseason that we almost have to wait and see, is this guy actually getting drafted at all? And right now, very early indicators is that he's not. His super early Yahoo ADP is 134. I mean, it's all over the map right now. So, I I mean, I think some of this stuff changes. Like, Colin Sexton is at 130, and he was much better than that last year. I don't, I don't think this stuff is going to stick. I think a lot of these ADPs were wedged in prior to the crazy free agency flurry. Although with faults, you know, Magic didn't do very much, so maybe that one doesn't move as much as some of the other ones around it. Regardless, Evan Fournier, he'll be underdrafted just because people are going to underrate what he does. Vooch is going to be a bit underdrafted because he's just sort of boring in his goodness. Aaron Gordon... He, of always being overdrafted, might finally be underdrafted this year. I don't know. He's he's going in the 80s again somehow. I thought maybe this would be the year where people finally soured on Gordon completely and, and gave up on him. Overall, last year, he did not have a great season. He finished at, uh, where the heck was he? Number 129. But over the last month and a half, when the Magic ratcheted up their speed, he was a top 50 guy. So which one do you think you're going to get? And if he's dra- if he's getting drafted at 80, that's probably too early for me because there is a big bottom to fall out with him, especially with the types of other guys you can get around 80 in fantasy drafts. Like right now, if we actually believed what we were seeing on Yahoo, other names going right around Aaron Gordon that I would far rather have on my team, Brooke Lopez, Thomas Bryant, Al Horford, Ricky Rubio, DeJounte Murray. These guys all going around Aaron Gordon. Yeah, I'll take the guys that are basically guaranteed wins over the guy that might be a good win, but could also be a big wet one. So he's he's still up in the air. I thought maybe this was going to be our opportunity. Regardless, uh, Terrence Ross also deserves a look at the end of your drafts. And, and I don't think anybody's drafting Terrence Ross because he's not really very interesting. He was number 102 this last year, but he was durable, averaged 15-3 and three with almost three three-pointers, a little over a steal, not good field goal percent, quite good at the free throw line, and also quite good at getting fouled when taking three-pointers. That's how he ends up getting most of his free throws. And he's getting drafted, you know, end of the 10th round, beginning of 11th round, He'll beat that. Terrence Ross was another member of the Magic this last year that dramatically leapt forward towards the end of the season. Magic are such a weird case study because for the entire season, if you take everything, bubble, playoffs, regular season, roll it all together, but actually, you know what? That's not actually particularly instructive. Let's just do the pre-bubble stuff. If you take the pre-bubble stuff, Jonathan Isaac was the best on the team at number 16. Vooch was right behind him at, at number 17. Then it was Fournier at 68, and then Terrence Ross at 105, Aaron Gordon at 126, Markel Fultz 161. Those are all the guys we just talked about. However, if you move the date range such that you're basically only looking from the all-star break on, which admittedly was only like about 10 games before they ended the NBA season, Vooch was 19. So he was still way up at the front. Jonathan Isaac was out, so that didn't matter. Terrence Ross was number 20 over those three weeks, which, again, limited sample size, but he was averaging 22 points a game. It's not going to keep up at that clip. Evan Fournier was 26. Aaron Gordon was 31. This was a team that was very sneaky, very sneakily piling up fantasy stuff, except Markel Fultz. He was still number 174, despite getting more playing time. Uh, This game just isn't translating right now. But they were hucking shots at that point. Aaron Gordon was running the offense from the high post. He averaged 15, 9, and 7 over that stretch. Fournier was 20 points. T. Ross was 22. Vooch was 22. 
There was fantasy stats for days. So I love the Magic this year, with the possible exception of Aaron Gordon, depending on where he gets drafted, because nobody else is getting drafted early enough. All of these guys are easy. Evan Fournier is going at 112 in these early numbers. Old men list. So simple sometimes. So simple sometimes. All we have to do is simplify. Before we do the Washington Wizards, I want to remind you guys that hoop ball leagues remain open. Nine category leagues. We have head to head. We have Roto. Uh, they're hosted over with our buddies at Fan Tracks. We'll just keep opening them as long as you guys keep joining them. Bug me on Twitter at Dan Bespris or email Team Hoop Ball at hoop ball.com if you want to get into one of those leagues. Same story on the recruiting side. If you'd like to be a part of what we're doing at Hoop Ball, we are looking for handicappers, DFS experts in all sports, not just basketball, salespeople, fantasy writers, podcasters, team coverage. If you think you got what it takes, join us here at Hoop Ball by sending me a tweet at Dan Bespris, D A N B E S B R I S, or using that email I mentioned before. That is, of course, Team Hoop Ball at hoop-ball.com. Last team to talk about on today's pod before we roll on into Thanksgiving show tomorrow, the Washington Wizards, who uh, retained Davis Bertans. He is back. John Wall returns from his long injury. And otherwise, there aren't that many big differences for this team. So the things we've discussed with Washington basically hold true even after free agency. I think the one thing we were looking at was like, okay, are you know are the, are the Wizards going to lose Davis Bertans? Is that going to open up something for someone else? And clearly it's not. He's still there. Uh, John Wall's return is going to put a dent into everything. And so the only thing you're looking at with this team is, where does Bradley Beal get drafted? Where did John Wall get drafted? Do I really want to risk it with Davis Bertans? Because his usage is going to take a hit this year. There's no question about it. Same with with Beal. I might even argue same storyline for Rui Hachimura. Just everybody's going to have a little bit less to to sink their teeth into. So how much are we willing to spend on these guys? Right now, Beal is going on the turn. That's a no-go for me. That's a non-starter. Yeah, he was great last year. He was number 11 in nine-category leagues. Surged towards the end of the season. But dude ain't taking 23 shots a game this coming year. No chance. Absolutely no chance he's getting that many looks every single game. Not with Wall back. Now, if John Wall gets traded, we have to wait and see what would potentially would come back. There just aren't that many contracts that can match up with that. Like, where could they send him? We've heard the Knicks were interested in Russell Westbrook. Does that mean they're also interested in Wall? I wouldn't be. You know, as tough as it would be to move Westbrook right now, it's triple as hard to move John Wall. At least Russ, yeah, he got exposed in the playoffs for not having any outside game. You know, his, his acceleration, his, his athleticism is, is down a bit. But Russ actually still had a pretty good regular season. He had his back-to-backs off. He played 53 of their regular season pre-bubble games, but he averaged 27 and a half, 8 and 7, shot 47% from the field. His field, his free throw percent came better. You're comparing, I mean, you could potentially argue that Westbrook and John Wall have the two hardest contracts to move in the NBA, but it's like Wall way at the top of that chart, and then Westbrook is a distant second worst. Distant. I mean, it's not, Westbrook was like near all-star level this last year. Maybe all-star level, depending on... I don't care who actually got voided in. I'm, I'm looking at the actual production on the floor. And he was really good for Houston this last season. John Wall hasn't played in a year and a half. Prior to getting hurt, he was out of shape. I made sort of a mean-spirited joke, and I sort of regret it. But at the same time, like... These guys need to stay in, sh- in shape. This is, th- this is their livelihood. They have a, a finite number of years to try to make their NBA money. John Wall got his $100 billion extension and then came back to training camp looking like 38-year-old Baron Davis. Like, he was big. He was puffy. And then, not surprisingly, his body broke down. So this is a guy now who's coming out and asking for a trade, but his value is crap at the moment. 
No one's seen him play other than team officials who were like, yeah, he looks great, great, yeah, you know, go ahead and take him. Take it on my word, he looked great. Here, you want, you want John Wall? I, can, I promise you he's fine. You don't need to see it. You don't need, you don't need, you don't need to see him play. He'll start the year with the Wizards. I'm, I'd be willing to bank most of what I own on that because if the Wizards were to try to move him right now, they would get nothing. They would get a handful of expiring contracts and it would basically be a salary dump. They need to convince John Wall to do what the Thunder convinced Chris Paul to do, which, again, Chris Paul had a bad year in Houston the previous season, but he was there. He had numbers people could look at and go, this guy looks like he's slowing down. But, eh, you know, maybe there's still something in there. With John Wall, no one has any idea what this guy's got in the tank right now. If they tried to move him at this moment, they would get nothing. So, no. There is this looming potential, of course. What if they trade him and they bring back guys that are not primary usage dudes. Yeah, that would be great for Bradley Beal and Davis Bertans. I don't know who they would bring back that could potentially match up. It doesn't sound like it's going to be Russ unless the Wizards are willing to pay through the nose for that point guard upgrade. I don't know why Houston would do it other than to maybe get assets, although the Rockets have actually had an offseason that makes it look like they still want to make a go for it this year. Confusing offseason to say the least. We'll get to the Houston. We'll get to Houston uh, soon enough. Uh, We got six of these divisions to break down. I don't know why I said five earlier in the week. I've lost my mind. Um, The one guy on Washington that I'm keeping an eye on is Thomas Bryant right now because he had a wonderful bubble. I was praying he wouldn't be that good in the bubble, but he was that good in the bubble. So he's getting drafted in the 80s right now. I think that's a great spot for him. He doesn't need big usage to be successful. He was right at the edge of the top 100 in only 23 and a half injury-prone minutes per game last year eight shots a night, he'll do more than that this coming year, just based on being on the floor more. Even if his usage doesn't trend in the right direction, uh, playing, you know, 28, 29 minutes instead of 24 is more than enough to get him inside the top 75, maybe higher. I mean, he was a first-round guy in the bubble. It's not going to be like that. There was no Beal, no Bertans, no Wall. He's not going to get 16, 17 shots a night, but give him 10, and he could very easily go for 14 and 8, with, you know, 1.6, 1.7 defensive stats, that's an easy that's an easy top 75 center. So I like Thomas Bryant this year. I think he'll be I think he'll be relative maybe a hair underdrafted, but a pretty safe grab because there really isn't anybody else coming for his minutes on that team. And then, you know, with John Wall, we just I don't I don't even know. You know early indications, early indications are that he's actually getting drafted relatively early, which is concerning. I think they got him going in the fourth round, so that's a no-go for me. I'm not taking him in the fourth round. Nine cat, I've got to believe he falls a bit farther than that. If he falls into the 60s, 70s, 80s range, then yeah, you take a strong look at it, but 40s? I mean, that's where he was at prior to getting hurt. You're going to spend that type of a pick on a guy who we have no idea what he's going to do or where he's going to be playing? Good Lord, no. Now, if Bradley Beal begins to fall towards the back end of the second round, I would take a nice long look at him. But if he's going at the front end of the second round, end of the first turn kind of guy, n- nope. Not much upside left there with him losing that much of what he was doing. His value is tied up in getting the ball. If he loses the ball for half the game, that's, that's backbreaking. I mean, he was good before Wall got hurt. He was, you know... 25 top 30 good he wasn't top 10 look for him to return to something like that which is still a very good fantasy player but if he's getting drafted at 11 12 there's almost no way he beats that number unless he plays in all 72 games that's your that's your path if the durability path is what you're looking for then yeah but i mean if i've got a pick on the turn i'm looking for somebody that i think can actually give me per game numbers near the turn Per game numbers near the turn, like a Kawhi Leonard, who will be better than that on a per game basis. Jason Tatum will probably have numbers somewhere near there. Who else is even going in that range? Kevin Durant. Risky, yeah. Don't think I can draft him with all the rest days, but he'll put per game numbers up like that. Something to think about. Always something to think about. That's our Wednesday show friends and family. I'll use that twice in the same program because, I don't know, I'm tired. It's the middle of the week, Thanksgiving tomorrow. 
Uh, we will have a show tomorrow morning. There will be a Thanksgiving show. I might record it tonight, drop it overnight, just so that uh, folks are not waiting on it first thing in the morning. Um, and we'll talk through the my bookie stuff on tomorrow's show as well, because I want to make sure everybody's getting in on the free money. MyBookie.ag. Get down on it. Get down on it. Let's do it. We'll do it together and on Friday. We'll make a bunch of money together without having to worry about anything. Uh, I'm Dan Baspers at Dan Baspers on Twitter. Hit me up if you want to be in a league or if you want to work for us here at HoopBall. We're taking contributors right now. Uh, and I think that's really the stuff for today's show. Have a great Wednesday, everybody. We'll te- check you out probably uh, in the middle of the night with tomorrow's episode. Uh, happy Thanksgiving if you don't listen to it beforehand. So long. This has been a Hoop Bowl presentation.